you're listening to the My Care Champion Cast. I'm your host, Lucy Shimatero of the Michigan Health and Hospital Association. Each month, we invite industry experts and thought leaders to discuss relevant healthcare issues. Join us as we explore key topics that affect Michigan hospitals, health systems, and the health of our communities. Hello, and welcome to episode 27 of the My Care Champion Cast. I'm your host, Lucy Shimatero, Assistant Director of Communications at the MHA. In the last couple of episodes, we discussed rural health, but today we'll be switching gears to a more timely topic for March. Today marks the start of Patient Safety Awareness Week, a national campaign for sharing patient safety practices and educational resources. With this in mind, we have a very special guest in studio, Adam Novak, who is a Director of Safety and Quality at the MHA Keystone Center. He's here to share the latest work of the Keystone Center and some upcoming opportunities offered by our Patient Safety Organization, or PSO, as you'll hear us discuss in the episode. Without further ado, Adam, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. So it's been a while since we've had a guest from Keystone on the podcast, so I'd love if you could start by just giving a little bit of background on what our MHA Keystone Center is, the work that you do, and and maybe what led to the role that you're in. Yeah, absolutely. So the MHA Keystone Center is the safety and quality improvement arm of the MHA, if you want to think about it that way. Um, In my role as director of safety and quality at the Keystone Center, I oversee the patient safety organization, or PSO, like you said. And uh, I also helped to spearhead the MHA workforce safety effort. So when I was hired into the Keystone Center, which is actually, I just hit my nine year wow. uh, mark. Wow, congratulations. So, yeah, March 3rd, <laughs> 2014. Um, so when I started at the MHA Keystone Center just over nine years ago, I had a lot of exposure to our quality improvement work, mm-hmm. and we were very active on the national scale. And then luckily, there were opportunities to become more involved in the PSO and safety efforts. And as our scope of work really evolved to include more staff safety interventions and programs, I was able to assume more of a leadership role within Keystone. That's amazing. So as mentioned, it's currently Patient Safety Awareness Week, which is very Mm -hmm. timely for the work that you do. Um, And that goes from March 12th to March 18th. So can you tell our listeners a little bit more about this week um, and how we can or how we are observing it as, as an organization? Yeah, absolutely. So Patient Safety Awareness Week is really an opportunity for healthcare professionals and organizations to highlight the importance of patient safety. Um, One of the things we're doing to observe this is hosting an in-person safe patient handling and mobility conference Mm -hmm. in April. So that's just on the horizon. And this conference will really feature hands-on patient handling and mobility simulations using lift equipment provided by several vendors. So we're actually going to bring in lift equipment manufacturers, the companies who are basically donating their lift equipment for us to use for a day. Wow. And we'll do these live simulations throughout the day featuring various scenarios. So what do you do if a patient falls on the ground? How do you safely lift them up? Hmm. Uh, Safe for the patient, but also uh, keeping in mind it's it's safe for the healthcare staff member as well, mm-hmm. the workforce. Um, and then we might do another scenario with another piece of lift equipment on how do you rotate a patient in the bed safely so not sustaining a strain if mm-hmm. you're the healthcare worker. And for the patient, ensuring that they're not sustaining further injury, they're not falling, for instance. So would you encourage people who are early in their career to attend or really any healthcare professional at any level? Absolutely. Anybody at any level. And we're really kind of tailoring this content to three primary role types Mm -hmm. uh, within healthcare organizations. So we have nurses, physical therapists, and occupational therapists. And our data tells us, because we collect and analyze OSHA, recordable incident rate data, Mm -hmm. which is basically work or injury data, uh, we know from that data that those three role types in particular are high risk at sustaining these types of injuries. Right. And so we really encourage them to attend, but it certainly is open to any Michigan hospital and and, uh, uh, their staff members as well. So uh, especially clinicians on the frontline physicians and physician assistants too. How did the idea for the conference come about? I'm just curious. Was it because there was a a great need there? Did you get feedback from some of our members that that was something that they were looking for? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's all really data driven. So I mentioned we collect OSHA recordable incident rate data, Mm -hmm. which is voluntarily submitted to us by hospitals throughout Michigan. And when we looked at that, we were able to Uh, identify that patient handling and mobility types of injuries 
even though they're not the most frequently occurring types of staph harm, we found out that sharps injuries, such as needle sticks, are actually the most frequently occurring. Mm. But typically, patient handling and mobility-related injuries result in uh, more severe harm to the staff member. There's more implications for patient safety as well. And the costs, the monetary costs for losing a staff member to an injury are much, much higher. Yeah. So that really drove our decision to go with uh, a patient handling a mobility related conference in this case. And so we're coordinating and, and contracting with a few different uh, subject matter experts and consultants to help facilitate this. Yeah. Well, I know being in corporate America, sometimes people hear the word conference and they think mm-hmm. it's going to be boring, but this sounds really hands on and engaging for the people who will attend. Yes, very hands-on, very demonstrative Mm -hmm. type of activities throughout the day. It will kick off with a little bit of background information, some traditional didactic presentations, Mm -hmm. but then we'll really be able to break out and pull everybody into these more hands-on simulations. That's awesome. I love that. Well, you mentioned data, and we know more than 90% of MHA member hospitals participate in our PSO. So can you talk a little bit more about what services we provide to our PSO members? Yeah, absolutely. And just by way of background to describe a little more in depth than what a uh, patient safety organization is or PSO is. So PSOs were actually established through the Patient Safety and Quality Improvement Act of 2005. And PSOs are federally listed entities that meet a host of uh, physical security, IT security, and patient safety activity requirements under that federal law. Mm -hmm. Um, And so... What we do, generally speaking, within the MHA Keystone Center PSO is analyze voluntarily submitted adverse event data, um, and then we communicate those lessons learned from that analysis to develop recommendations for mitigating the risk of these adverse events happening again in the Mm -hmm. future. Mm -hmm. And so really the power of the Patient Safety Act and PSOs is fostering a culture of reporting. Uh, by providing legal protections for the reporters, which is basically uh, the staff, but also the organizations are kind of considered the providers and the reporters in this case. And so the idea behind that uh, is that we are taking a non-punitive approach to learning from healthcare safety events, which encourages more reporting. And then the more data that we have access to, the more effective we can be at investigating those adverse events and putting processes in place to prevent them from happening in the future. Mm -hmm. So here at the MHA Keystone Center PSO, we engage in many safety activities ranging from various levels of data analysis to in-person member meetings that discuss specific types of adverse events. These would be things things like falls, pressure injuries, and hospital-acquired infections. So just to highlight a few specific activities. Yeah. Again, probably first and foremost, what we do quite literally on a daily basis is high-level aggregate data analysis. So this is across millions of adverse event records that have been submitted to us into our database. Um, And one example of how we utilize that data analysis is uh, within the last couple of years, what we've been doing is looking at monthly falls rates, for instance. So falls are a type of adverse event, it's submitted to us, the data comes to us, and we can trend that data over days, weeks, months, years, et cetera, Mm -hmm. um, and break it down in a multitude of ways. And so over the course of three years, we actually uh, went ahead and did some analysis on our submitted falls data. We calculated the upper and lower control limits and really saw an unprecedented spike in falls across our membership, so across Michigan hospitals, mm. in April of 2020, which is right when the pandemic took off right. in Michigan. Yeah. And so because of that analysis and because we were able to identify that it was special cause variation mm-hmm. uh, where it spiked above the upper control limit, we were able to then uh, quickly alert our members to this trend and they could take action. So that's kind of an example of what we do with our data on a daily basis. A couple other things we do. One is we convene a quarterly root cause analysis and action or RCA squared review committee. Mm. So this is a group of about 15 safety professionals from our member hospitals who review several non-identifiable RCAs. So uh, we take all of the identifiable information out of them. And then this group of 15 subject matter experts reviews these 
RCAs in depth and looks for commonalities across things like root causes, contributing factors, and actions that were put in place to mitigate that future risk. And then what we do is we take all of that information, we distill it down into a one page, what we call safety alert. Mm -hmm. And we send that out to the broader PSO membership so they can learn kind of preemptively from those events and put their own processes in place um, to, to ensure that that kind of thing doesn't happen at their own organization. Right. And then the final thing I'll just highlight are safe tables. Mm -hmm. So this has been a staple of our PSO in terms of a patient safety activity for uh, years and years. And basically, safe tables are small focus groups convened to discuss specific safety topics and potential solutions. So again, I mentioned, um, you know, we tackle HAI, which is uh, healthcare acquired infections. We look at faults. We look at medication adverse events, mm -hmm. pressure injuries, all kinds of things. So safe tables can be convened around any of those specific topics. Right. And we bring all these uh, PSO healthcare workforce members together to discuss these topics, have an in-depth kind of work group style meeting uh, with the idea of us walking away from that meeting with tangible next steps to delve deeper into those issues and help come up with solutions. So those yeah. are just uh, a few of the, I'll say, core activities of our PSO. Yeah, I appreciate you walking through those. I don't think people are as aware of what the Keystone Center has been up to. Right. So those examples are, are really helpful. Um, and just speaking from working over at the CAC, um, downtown Lansing, mm -hmm. I know that data is a huge driver of the work that we do. And I, that's across the board uh, at our association. So yep. um, have you received feedback from the people who participate in the PSO? What are do you have any testimonies that you could share that people have found? What have they found most valuable? Yeah, absolutely. So we do get a lot of feedback, which is great. I just had a meeting earlier today over lunch with a couple of our members from mm -hmm. a major system in the state about um, how we can help them with things like, I mentioned the RCA Review Committee, so things like RCA Squared Training, and that's a very high-value add activity within the PSO. Mm -hmm. The data feedback, again, with the falls, being able to trend that over time, but then being able to dive into the data, really pull it apart and work alongside the hospital to figure out what's going on, why they're seeing an increase in falls. It could be one of 45 different things, right. and then you're able to tailor an intervention uh, to that specific cause of that problem at that organization. So it's not a one size fits all type of approach. And we've received feedback from many members that that's really what they're looking for. They're looking to see what is their data showing them mm -hmm. and how can we help them put things in place, uh, actions in place to make sure that those types of adverse events don't happen again down the road. Right, and I'm sure, you know, amid the pandemic, there's an even higher influx of requests for data in the safety and quality oh, areas of, of healthcare. Absolutely. It has been a whirlwind, to say the least, throughout the pandemic. Uh, but certainly, different trends have been emerging because of the pandemic. So I mentioned the falls. Right. Um, but we also saw an increase in pressure injuries. A lot of that mm. was due to we found out when we did some digging, and we actually have a, a really nice tight-knit network of PSOs nationally. So I'll reach out to our colleagues in different states who mm. are uh, PSOs and ask, are they seeing these trends? Yeah. Um, and so with the pressure injuries, what we found is that uh, as patients with COVID were presenting to the hospital and either to prevent them from being ventilated, if possible, uh, or to simply just assist with breathing, they would uh, uh, prone them. So they would put them on their stomach mm. um, and that would help with breathing. But then there were a lot of uh, pressure points right. on you know, the face, on the uh, lips, specifically the nose, the chin, mm -hmm. things of that sort. So again, that's the type of analysis that members reach out to us constantly and say, especially now, as you point out during the pandemic, yeah. uh, you know, we need more help with this. And then when we do provide that help, they give us great feedback that it it was a, a value adding uh, experience. Absolutely. Well, how can hospitals uh, participate in the MHA Keystone Center who might be interested and aren't already involved? Yeah. So, uh, interested hospitals, if if they want to get 
some basic information about some of the things we're talking about here, they can go to the MHA.org website. Mm -hmm. And on the right-hand side of the screen, there's an MHA Keystone Center tab. Yep. And so if they click that, they'll see all of our resources, both quality and safety related, but certainly um, there's a number of things on there that provide additional information on our various safety activities, which would fall under the PSO. And is that where they can go to find more information about the upcoming conference on April 13th too? Yes. And I would also say to look out for our monthly newsletters mm. and visit our social media channels as well. So we're very active, as you know, on uh, uh, numerous different social media platforms, mm -hmm. uh, Twitter, certainly LinkedIn, Facebook. Um, so getting in touch with those resources is also a great way to learn more about this uh, conference and any upcoming education we have. Yes. And I know we'll be sharing some information on our, our MHA channels as well. So we'll <laughs> provide links in the description of the episode for all of those platforms. But um, to bring it back to Patient Safety Awareness Week a little bit, what would you say are some actionable steps Michigan hospitals can take this week to observe Patient Safety Awareness Week? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. So one simple step hospitals can take is to acknowledge their staff for speaking up for safety. Mm -hmm. So this is something across the board that's relatively easy to implement, um, especially meaningful when it comes from leadership as well. So when leaders acknowledge their staff for speaking up, for instance, if they have a concern with the quality or safety and care, mm -hmm. uh, that can really go a long way to improving patient safety, improving staff safety as well, and improving the overall safety culture of the organization. And so uh, kind of to piggyback off of that, one really cool program we have uh, is called the MHA Keystone Center Speak Up Award, and that acknowledges the frontline healthcare staff in PSO member hospitals who speak up for patient or staff safety, quite literally many times. Mm -hmm. um, and so information about this program can be found on the Keystone Center webpage. So again, if you go to mha.org, click on the Keystone Center tab, you can find out more information. You can see um, which hospitals have had winners in the past. Um, you can see what they spoke up about, the types of harm that they actually prevented by speaking up, yeah. which is ju it's just a really feel-good kind of story because so often in the safety world in healthcare, we're doing uh, retrospective analysis. We're doing those root cause analyses where an incident happened, harm, sometimes catastrophic, has yeah. happened. How do we learn from that uh, as we move forward? But with the Speak Up Award type uh, acknowledgement program, we're actually looking at harm that never occurred. Right. It was prevented because somebody spoke up. And I will say too that we actually published a peer-reviewed journal article on this, some research in uh, the Journal for Healthcare Risk Management back in 2019, and that data showed um, that encouraging this type of psychologically safe behavior of speaking up where staff really feel comfortable raising a concern, stopping the line if they need to. Right. For instance, if they're about to administer a medication and they think that it may be the wrong medication or the wrong patient it's being administered to or the wrong time or the wrong route, et cetera, they speak up, they stop the line, everybody on the care team uh, pauses and reviews the information, listens to the concern, and then if it warrants further action, that's where that action takes place. That's where the next steps of figuring out how to rectify this takes place. Um, and so patients and care partners who feel safe raising concerns about care, uh, as well as healthcare staff, not only improves the safety culture, but also lowers costs across the spectrum, mm -hmm. uh, the continuum of care. So those are costs not being absorbed by patients, by their care partners, right. families, healthcare organizations, payers, et cetera. Um, so again, to kind of circle back, that's one easy kind of low hanging fruit to celebrate and observe Patient Safety Awareness Week that I would really encourage hospital leaders, but honestly, everybody at healthcare organizations right. to do. Yeah, create the culture that makes it safe to Absolutely. speak up. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So can you submit nominations for the Speak Up Award any time of year, or is it it's always open for yes. anybody to, to fill out those nominations? Yes, so forms? it's on a rolling 
um, nomination process. So mm -hmm. it's always open for nominations. We do these quarterly. So if you miss the deadline by, you know, even an hour or something, you would just be rolled into the next quarter. Oh, so that's great. So every single nomination is considered every single staff member um, is is looked at, their story is reviewed, and we present those stories actually to the MHA Keystone Center Board of Directors meetings. Um, we do on-site celebrations with hospital leadership, with the uh, awardee, of course, yes. and many times they bring their family members. Uh, their family members bring flowers. They their do speeches. Their coworkers are there. Their I've, coworkers yes, are there. I have attended one. They are very. Yes. they're nice. And yeah. so it's it's really a heartwarming experience and a very important message. I think that's being sent that this is incredibly important work. Yeah. Um, and it really does go a long way in improving safety mm -hmm. of uh, patients and staff. Yeah. And do the nominations have to come from a, a person in a position of leadership or can it come from a coworker? Nope. Anybody can nominate anybody. Yeah. You can even nominate yourself if you want. We've never <laughs> had that actually. And we have Humble well over brag. a thousand. Yeah. Well over a thousand nominees. This program actually launched in uh, March of 2014. So it's it's been highly successful. Yeah. It's gone a long way. Again, we published the research. We've actually had organizations from around the country reach out and uh, speak with us about emulating this program, this mm -hmm. process. Yeah. Um, and our research was picked up by patient safety organizations in other countries as well. Wow. So it, we really are truly making a difference with yeah. this. So. And setting an example, which is amazing. Absolutely. So are there any other Keystone initiatives listeners should know about coming up? Yeah. So one thing I did want to mention, I would highly suggest that listeners download a free copy of our Advancing Health Equity Guide from mm -hmm. the MHA Keystone Center webpage. So again, you can go to mha.org, click the Keystone tab, and download this Advancing Health Equity Guide uh, completely free of charge. And so this guide provides a blueprint for healthcare organizations to eliminate disparities in care and by doing so advancing health equity. And it really provides uh, a good understanding of not only key terms that are germane to the principles of health equity, but ultimately helps the healthcare organization um, achieve the quadruple aim. And so Many people are probably familiar, many listeners are familiar with the quadruple aim, um, but it's essentially enhancing the care for the individual, the experience for the patient on that level, um, improving population health, um, reducing per capita health care costs, and then the final piece of that quadruple aim is the staff piece and attaining joy and wellness for healthcare staff uh, in their jobs and also physical safety. Um, and so really what this, what this guide aims to do is achieve that by looking at these issues through the lens of health equity. Yeah. So I would absolutely encourage uh, listeners to go take a look at that. And it helps you evaluate where you're at within your journey to mm -hmm. achieve the most equitable care possible. Right. Well, I know um, our CEO, Brian Peters, talks a lot about health equity being one of our strategic pillars for the mm -hmm. program year. And I know it'll continue to be top of mind going into the new program year. So definitely. it's a really important resource. Um, definitely check it out if you haven't already. Um, Adam, you already mentioned that we can go to the MHA website to learn more about the Keystone Center. Can you mention again, though, there's a newsletter and then... Yep, a newsletter, um, our social media channels. Mm -hmm. So again, I would highly recommend LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook. We do have a multitude of other social media channels that we leverage as well, TikTok and various <laughs> yes. other things. I'm not <laughs> Thank as hip you for with the that plug. one. Yeah, but, the, uh, the TikTok is still in its infancy, so we can't promise any content just yet. But <laughs> right. hopefully soon. Um, it'll be really wonderful eventually to highlight some of the members who are doing that really important safety quality work. Um, so we're looking forward to that and appreciate you coming on the podcast today to talk a little bit about it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. With that, I'd like to thank our listeners for tuning in and encourage you head to our website, mha.org, to learn more about the MHA Keystone Center. Thanks again, and stay tuned for our next episode in April. Thanks for listening to the My Care Champion Guest. To learn more or get involved, visit mha.org.